All right. <coughs> we talked about industries of the future, but today we're going to talk about literally a, 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 the corporation of the future, specifically. But more importantly, we're going to talk about what I call a new capitalism for a new economy. Right? Everybody says nowadays, well, we're capitalistic countries, and we have market economies. Well, that's true, we do. And it's indisputably true that the Western uh, liberal market-based capitalistic system has performed better than any other system, okay? Uh, in generating wealth, in, in, in improving people's quality of life, okay? I mean, Ukrainians know this. <laughs> Go talk to your grandparents. What was the quality of life in this country, okay, in the 1930s or 40s or 50s? Well, look at today. Do we have problems in Ukraine today? Oh, wow. <laughs> but, 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 but the country is a million times better today than it was a generation or two generations ago. And a lot of that, a lot of that has to do with moving towards a capitalist way of doing business. That said, our current system of capitalism is in really, really, really big trouble and it's in need of massive reform. Everything has to be reformed, right? Nothing is perfect. And, and every human system is designed by humans for their time. But then those humans grow old and die and times change. And if the systems don't change, then we all end up kind of being trapped by the mistakes of the past that we're not fixing in the future. And our current market system has a lot of really big problems, which we're only now becoming aware of. Okay, and they're going. We got We have to fix those problems with the market economy. We have to fix those problems with capitalism. Um, well, or we're going to like destroy the planet and have a bad day. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> sounded depressing, didn't it? Okay. But but you gotta to, first of all to to, to, to 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 solve any problem you have to make yourself really painfully aware, honestly, what is the problem. Okay? And not pretend that there aren't problems. Okay. Now <laughs> because this is a business school, we're going to have a test. Oh. Oh, isn't that cool? All right, but I got some good news. It's a, it's a, unlike your final exam, this is a one question test. Oh, all right, that's, that's cool. Okay, all right. Does that make me the most popular faculty member? Right? A one question test. And to make it even better, to further increase my popularity, it's a true false question. So, I mean, you know, you got a 50% probability of getting the right answer even if you're like sleeping, okay? All right, but this is a, this is a tough question, right? Here's the question. A new capitalism for a new, new economy. economy. What's the answer? A new capitalism for a new economy. Bravo. All right, let's uh, so much for So much for high tech. Uh -huh. why, is it that, why is it that I have a problem with this? Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, there we go. Damn. I can say that. We're having technical difficulties. Everybody knows, you know. At some point, at some point, you know, your, your, your computer won't reboot unless you swear at it, right? Everybody knows that. All right. True, true or false? All right. Now, this is actually a serious question. Okay. True or false? False. 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 Obviously. False. <laughs> We're having a true difficulties here. Okay. That's that. That's that. It's going backwards. Oh, yeah. Then it doesn't go. Okay. Well, I already gave you the answer. I'm excited. 
but that's cool. Actually, if you were really paying attention, you already saw the answer. If you weren't, think how foolish you'll feel when you raise your hand and give the wrong answer. Because I just showed you three times. All right, seriously. Corporations exist to maximize shareholder profits. The true or false, the man who came up with this concept was named Milton Friedman. He, he, he's, a, a, I believe, a Nobel Prize winning economist, long dead, from the early 1980s. And all of his research and all of his life as an economist led him to this conclusion that corporations exist to maximize shareholder profits. Every business school everywhere in the world still kind of mostly teaches that. Open up your finance textbooks. You're going to see corporations exist to maximize profits. Now, how many, <laughs> you guys got to all get the right answer. How many believe that's true? Maybe. That's actually a, that's actually a brilliant answer. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Now, I kind of gave the game away. It's false. But I'm telling you, if you go look in, in your business finance textbook, you'll probably see at some point the assertion that corporations exist to maximize shareholder profit. I can assure you that the entire Western world corporate capitalist system remains completely focused on, on believing that and doing that, and this is the biggest problem we have with our current system, okay? Now, to make you understand why this is false, it's not only false, okay? It was false in 1981, I think, when Milton Friedman first published. It's not only false, it's actually destructively false. It's actually dangerously false. And you can, and, and I'm gonna show you why, but then I'm going to show you how this is all changing now, okay? Um, first, um, what, what is a corporation? All right, now we're not gonna talk you know, legally and statutes and agreements, but think about this. Corporations, through, by the way, we've had corporations for a thousand years, okay? Corporations exist for a purpose. You, when you, you, you know, you want to you grow food, you create a corporation. You want to produce steel, you create a corporation. You want to educate students, you create a corporation. Okay, we're a not-for-profit corporation, right? Um, governments are corporations. The city of Kiev is a corporation. Right? Now, the, ultimately, the owners are citizens, but it operates like a corporation. It has a budget, it has goals, okay? It can operate at a profit, it can operate at a loss. Cor every corporation exists for a purpose, right? So, that purpose has to be something more than just maximizing the, sh the, the, the wealth and the income of the shareholder. You know, it has to be. Now, it really isn't. If you go switch on CNN, BBC, someone's going to stand there and they're going to say, and the stock market, you know, declined 0.1% today. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average of the American New York Stock Exchange rose by 200 points. That is absolutely irrelevant, meaningless information. First of all, because 92% of all stock trades um, are done by the top 1% wealthiest corporations and people in the world, right? So 92% of all the shares of stock of everything in America is owned by only about 1% of corporations and people. And 99% of all the trades are done by supercomputers, right? You know, where you're trading millions of shares in, in literally seconds. So, so to stand up at the at, at the close of business at a stock exchange and say, well, the stock market went up 200 points, it's a good day, but tomorrow the stock market goes down 200 points, and they say that's a bad day. It's totally irrelevant. Why do they do that? Because they're focusing on shareholders' income. What is the income, what is the wealth of a shareholder? Well, I got 100 shares of stock, and, and each share of stock's worth a dollar, so I got $100 of wealth. And if the 
market price of my stock goes down, my wealth goes down. And that means the stock market's going down. And so we report that on BBC and CNN. But it's, it's, the focus is all wrong. The emphasis is all wrong. There's no information there. It's meaningless. So let's be clear about, about exactly what a corporation is, right? A corporation is a, a separate legal entity that exists completely separate from its own. So if you think of you know, Ford Motor Company, it goes back to the early 20th century. Every original shareholder of the Ford Motor Company is dead. Right? Sad, they died of old age. Well, but Ford Motor Company is still with us because corporations exist separately from their owners. Now, this, this is actually a, a blessing and a curse because what this means is corporations can exist forever. And when you build something like a corporation, and the original people who built it, they had a purpose, okay? And maybe that was a good purpose. Maybe that was a really socially responsible purpose. But through time, they grow old, they die, you get new shareholders. The corporation, because it can exist forever, the corporation begins to take on a life of its own. And, and if you think of like big oil companies, or you think of these big coal mining companies, the people who work at ExxonMobil, or the people who work for you know, DTEC, they know they're destroying the planet by, by mining coal and oil and, 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 and promoting you know, power generation from, from coal, okay? and, and continuing to promote gas-guzzling automobiles. But the people who work there, they can't really do anything about it, because the corporation kind of has like a life of its own. So if you make me chairman of the board of ExxonMobil, what am I supposed to do? Give an order and then we start producing wind energy? <laughs> well, I'd be fired. I'd be fired in about five seconds. So this, this, this is, it's a blessing and it's a curse. Because, you know, we're not just trying to sort out problems amongst human beings. We're trying to sort out problems amongst human beings and corporations that basically exist independently of us. And again, it went backwards. This thing is, I'm telling you, it's not me. Oh, it's a corporation. <laughs> All right, we'll solve these problems later. Uh, this word, agency, right? human beings have agency. Agency means you, you, you can think, you can take decisions, you can own something, you can buy something, sell something, right? Agency, right? Corporations have agency. A corporation, separately from all the owners of the corporation. Corporations can sign contracts, they can buy things, they can sell things, they can own things, okay? Corporations can, can, can lobby governments in the name of the corporation. Okay, maybe a law, you're doing it, but, but it, you know, it's, it's the corporation that will get the benefit. So corporations have, have agency. And what's happening nowadays is that people, progressive thinking people all over the world, are beginning to focus on this issue of agency and this issue of corporate purpose and beginning to understand that we have to align corporate purpose with social purpose. Think again of the oil companies. Okay? And we, we have to figure out how to channel the power of corporate agency into more positive directions, less negative directions. Okay? We need, we need more wind corporations and less oil corporations, okay? And that's, this is where a lot of progressive thinking is going. And these are, these are issues that you're going to have to struggle with. See? I'm telling you, the whole thing is going to be wacky. Okay? All right? Thank you.
How'd you do that? Uh, it's bad. Alright. Uh, okay. Well then here, go forward. Just press on button. Yeah, you mean the one I was pressing? It, it's just, it's afraid. It's afraid. Alright. Um, everybody meet, meet, everybody meet the A plus number one student of Concordia University. Why? Because he saved me. <laughs> All right, that's, that, that's what we call capital in the bank, okay? All right, look, I want to, I want to talk about these. All right, let's assume that we're going to create a corporation, all of us together, all right? All of us together. We're all going to be co-equal shareholders in a corporation. Because I know how to use this tool better than any of you, I get to be the chairman of the board of the corporation. Okay. Right. So, think about this. Here's our corporation. Now, when you decide to form a corporation, let's say we're going to create a corporation to uh, uh, produce steel. We're going to build a steel mill. Something simple. Steel is very simple. We create a corporation. We're going to need financial capital, right? Yeah. Right? All right? Everybody can agree we need financial capital. We need to sell some stock to get some money. We need to borrow money from a bank. We need the shareholders to put in their cash. That's easy, right? That's easy. That's in all your finance textbooks. We're going to need what we call produced capital. Right? This is a steel mill, so we need big blast furnaces, and we need buildings, and we need equipment, and we need we need some, you know, railroad uh, lines to bring in the raw materials. We need coal, we need iron, we need chromium. So we need all of this produce capital. We call it produce capital because some human being, us or someone else, literally has to produce it. Somebody has to produce the building, produce the machinery, produce the equipment, produce the, 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 the rail line and the cars, and mine the coal, mine the iron ore, okay? So this is all produced capital. What about this? Anybody want to say something about that? Do we need this? Yes. Ah, yeah, but, but, what exactly do we mean by human capital? Just X number of workers who will come to work the day shift for eight hours and do some kind of job? No. Yep. Like circular representatives. Yeah. Yeah. No. You're 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 on to the thought. Okay. If you went back 50 years ago to a steel mill, all you needed was, it was almost always men, you needed some man to come and to do some repetitive kind of work, period. Right? But nowadays, if we're going to build socially responsible corporations, and we're going to build corporations that will be accepted by the world population, we're going to have to focus on more than just giving some person a job for some amount of money. We have to focus on their entire life. We have to think about their health. We've got to think about their family's health. We have to start thinking about, you know, how, how do they send their kids to college. We have to think about, you know, how much crime is in their neighborhood. Are they coming to work, uh, 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 like, malnourished and kind of unhealthy because they're smoking too much and drinking too much, right? Because, because we're now learning in our market economy that we have to focus on, on people as if they're people, okay? <laughs> right? Not just workers on a ledger, okay? This has been a huge psychological, it's been a huge psychological shift. But keep in mind, that all those things I listed 
they, they, they cost a lot of money. I mean, I just talked about you know, public, I mean, the, the health of this guy, the health of his family, his psychological health. Well, somebody's got to, somebody's got to pay for that. The corporation has to pay, or the society at large has to pay, in order to develop, in a positive way, human capital. All right? Hold that thought, okay? There's a lot of expense here. And there's a lot of asset value here. You said it yourself, right? You want somebody to come to work and be productive. If I go to work and, I, and I, 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 I'm, I'm productive, I mean, I actually kind of like my, my employer, I kind of like my company, I might come up with an idea that makes the company a billion dollars. And then the company might be nice and give me 10% of that as a bonus. If I come to my job and I hate my supervisor, and I hate the company, and I feel bad about, about producing some product, you know, like I work in a tobacco factory, and I know the product I'm producing is killing people, and I feel bad about that. Well, I, I'm going to be unproductive. I'm going to be unimaginative, uncreative. Why, why should I do that? So there's a lot of positive aspects to developing human capital, and there's a lot of expenses. Okay, hold that thought. What about natural capital? Do we need any of that for our company? Yes. Depends on the business. True. Is there any business that does not need natural capital? That's a tough question. Somebody say IT. Okay, IT. Who said IT? Ah. Well, precisely. That are produced from natural education. Right. Well, education. Well, education. Education requires a building, and we got to build the building out of the materials. The building has to sit on a piece of land. It could be used for fun. Natural is everywhere. Right, right, right. You cannot escape. Think about this. Our company, if our company is going to succeed, we have to breathe air. Okay? And if the air is really toxic, we're in big trouble. We have to use water. We might want to drink it in the cafeteria. We might want to use it in some of our processes. And, and the more polluted the water, the more horrible that is. All right? we, may, we may be consuming land or, or minerals or timber. Okay? There's, um, there's so many natural assets. We are going to consume them, but the question is, are we going to pay for them? And if we pay for them, will we get like some additional profit, right? There's kind of a big, I hope you see there's already kind of a big disconnect here. I can open up a steel mill and I can pollute the hell out of the water, especially if I'm in a country where I just pay a small bribe to the environment minister. I can pollute the water, I can pollute the air, right? I can cut down trees, I can create all this toxic environment that damages the very human capital that I'm trying to employ because they live within 10 or 20 miles, you know, 50 kilometers, say, of my factory. So I can consume a lot of these. I can get a lot of benefit, I meaning our corporation. Our corporation can consume, our corporation can get benefits. But maybe we will and maybe we won't have to pay for any of this. Mm -hmm. Often water is cheap and air is free. And, and the damage we do doesn't get compensated. And, and, and if we start doing damage here, we're also doing damage over here. Okay? So just think about that. We've got kind of a kind of, there's something wrong here, don't you think? There's something wrong going on here. This is very simple. This is very simple, right? All right. We're going to move to an account. We're going to move to the subject of accounting here. Right? Balance sheets. This is really simple. This is really simple. This is why textbooks in business and finance they concentrate on this. Business textbooks concentrate on those because they're simple. But these are very difficult. What about this? Does anybody want to take a guess what it is I mean by social capital? Too high on the risk. <laughs> now, now you're down from an A plus to an A with Cuban. <laughs> I love you. You're great. 
<coughs> yes. All right. All right. She was commenting on the issue of wellness in a social context. All right. Let me let me make this. I agree. Let me make this easy. It's not easy. There are two kinds of social capital. And it's impossible, it's absolutely impossible for any corporation to operate, any, it's impossible for any corporation to do anything without consuming social capital as well as natural capital. Two kinds of social capital. There's roads, roads and bridges and metro lines, right? There's schools that educate your workers, that's social capital. There's hospitals that provide for the health care, we hope your workers, our workers, okay? So you have all this physical capital. Think of our steel mill. Without, without ports and railroads and highways, how, does, how, how do intermediate products, how do, how do the employees of the company get here? And without schools and hospitals, how could they ever live here? So. So we are, we are consuming as a corporation, we're consuming social capital. We're, we're, we're putting our, our railroad cars on the railroad line, we're driving our trucks on the highway. Uh, our, our, our employees are using the metros and using the buses, right? Uh, they're going to the schools, they're going to the hospital. We're consuming this, but are we paying for any of that? Are we investing anything in any of that? Hmm. So think about this, right? Look at these, look at these little circles here again. Our corporation, oh by the way, at the, the social, there's the intangible. There's the physical and there's the intangible. Um, if a corporation exists in a city and everybody hates the corporation, that's kind of negative social capital, right? If you exist in a city and the government is incompetent, and the government is corrupt, that's negative social capital. If you live in a city and there's a lot of crime, and this crime is affecting all the people who work at your company, and so they come to work stressed, worried that what's going to happen to my family when I'm at work, is someone going to break into my house or steal my car? Okay, This kind of intangible social capital, it can be positive, it can be negative, and, and again, we could, be, we could be the cause of some of that, okay, right? We could, we could be operating our corporation in a way that drives down property values and makes this city a bad place to live and people are leaving and you got vacant houses and vacant houses always creates crime and, and there you go. So again, we are, we are consuming we might be investing, we are consuming, we might be investing, we're consuming, we might be investing. But it's, a, it's, 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 it's all confusing, it's, it's all kind of weird. You can't wrap your head around it as easily as you can. Uh, I got a hundred shares of stock, we got a million dollars in the bank, right? We got a million dollars cash, we got a hundred shares of stock, we got a line of credit. Right, we got a loan, we got, we got buildings, land, equipment. This is all simple stuff. This becomes really weird. So, up until just very recently, corporations, governments, business schools just ignored this. We just ignored it because, because it was easier to ignore it than to try to deal with it. But you know, with more than 7 billion people on the planet, and standards of living rising, which means consumption rising, and we're looking at another three billion people coming to join us here. <laughs> we can't, we can't ignore these anymore. We can't ignore them. But hey, you know, we just don't know what the heck to do about it. See, here it is, going back. Okay, keep going. Uh huh. Look, look, look. There's our boxes. Boom. Next one, stop. Which one are you pushing? Oh, you push the light. It's a secret. I know, but. Uh,
I was pushing that. Just ask me how quick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm telling you, man, you're, 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 you're building up some social capital. All right. Look. So, think about this. We are consuming, as a corporation, every corporation, we are consuming all of those assets. All right? All of, all of those. We are consuming all of those things. Are you guys studying accounting? Not yet. Not yet. Some of us are. Okay. Accounting. Here's how accounting works. I'm going to show you a balance sheet here pretty soon. Accounting, you got assets. Those are good. You've got liabilities. Those are bad. And they balance. Hopefully. <laughs> okay? So, this is not an accounting class. But if you take accounting, it doesn't matter. You take IFRS, International Financial Reporting System. You take the Ukrainian standards, which are shifting over now to IFRS. You take any country's accounting standards. You take any balance sheet of any corporation anywhere in the world, and you're going to see that they, that balance sheet, they will report on the value of their financial capital and their produced capital. They're going to report on the value. They're going to report on how much are we consuming, right? How much do we own? How much did we invest? How much did we sell? Right? They're going to they're going to report on that because they always have reported on that ever since about. I think the Venetians invented uh, 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 double entry bookkeeping in the 12th or 13th century. So, you know, so for like a thousand years, people report on that. So it's simple. But hey, I want everybody to notice that for once I pushed the same button, and, I, and it actually and it actually did what I wanted to do. Okay, so so there you have it. But here's the big problem in our world, in your world. Okay. <laughs> this is not recorded. There is no balance sheet of any corporation anywhere in the world that is recording the consumption, the investment, the expense of these items. And yet, every corporation in the world is consuming them. Some corporations are making them better. Many corporations are making them worse. But but that doesn't matter. Nobody is reporting it. We have no data that's being collected. We have no, we have, you can't take a balance sheet and see anything. All right? Here is a typical balance sheet. Don't pay any attention to any of the numbers. Okay? So that makes me the most popular accounting professor on the earth. All right? There's a balance sheet. Ignore all the numbers. Seriously, the numbers are irrelevant. Notice, on a balance sheet, notice what's here. We've got assets and we got liabilities, okay? Look at, look at what we have here. All of this is, is all financial assets. Okay, that might be some produced capital. If it's a steel mill, we might have, you know, some steel in process. We might have some raw materials, coal or iron, whatever. But it's almost all financial. This is all produced capital, all physical, land, buildings, machinery, equipment. Uh, this might be, this is also produced capital. This might be a trademark, right? It might be a brand. If this was Roshan, then there would be a value here for the Roshan brand, which is a very valuable brand. Could be patents, could be copyright. Point is, this is all financial, and it's all that physical produced capital. That's it. On every balance sheet of every corporation in the world, that's all there is. And if you look on the li liabilities, again, it's all, it's all financial. It's all financial. The accounts payable, notes payable, our expenses, the value of our stock, financial, 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 that's all it is. This is all financial, and this is about half financial and half of produced capital. Geez, I'm sorry, but that's, that's just, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, thank you. Who, who did that? Did you do that? Okay. Incomplete. But I'll tell you, I, I like another word. It's stupid. Don't think about it. Come on. How in the world 
can you have an entire world economy that doesn't measure all of these things that corporations are consuming or investing in or destroying, right? And we, we, don't, we don't record it, we don't measure it, we don't record it, okay? So our balance sheet is totally incomplete. And, you know, if it's incomplete on this side, it's incomplete on that side. Now notice, for those of you studying accounting, don't go tell the accounting professor that Paul said, dude, accounting is stupid. No. Accounting. Um, everything I've ever done in my life has been based on accounting, okay? Uh, you can't make money without accounting. Everything I've ever done, okay, is based on accounting. Um, there, the, our accounting system, right, whether it's some um, country's national system or it's this IFRS, International Bench Report, it's all correct. It's absolutely perfect and correct because it is measuring exactly what we want it to measure. The problem is not the accounting system, the problem is the human psychology. We're not, we're not willing or able to measure the complete integrated holistic effect of our corporation, good or bad, on the world and because, or maybe we don't care, okay? I don't think British tobacco cares, for example, <laughs> all right? Either we don't know, we don't care, we say it's too hard, we just ignore it. We ignore the human capital, we ignore the source, we ignore the natural. So we're producing a perfectly accurate balance sheet that is terribly incomplete. So, what does this mean? Do you guys know the definition of the word myopic? Like both sided. Like that, yeah. This is a really powerful word. So I'm going to tell you the meaning of this word. Really powerful. Myopic means that you are just exclusively focused on one thing, period. That's, I mean, you're just focused on one thing to, to, and, and ignoring everything else. So our current capitalist system, our current corporate capitalist system, is myopically focused on financial success. That's all we care about. Maximize shareholders' income. And maximize it quarter by quarter so that your stock price doesn't decline and supercomputers start selling your stock, okay? That's all we care about. And, 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 I, and I know that's all we care about because that's all we measure. Remember the balance sheet? I mean, all, all we're measuring is financial stuff. And even when we say, oh, well, we have some, some buildings and some land and some equipment, yeah, but we're, we're actually putting a financial number on that. The land has this value, and the equipment has this value, and the buildings have this value. Financial, 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 that's all we care about. And we're just, as a, as a, as a human race, we're just focused myopically, right, singularly to the exclusion of everything else on financial success. All right, here's where... Here's where the problems get really kind of ugly, but then we'll go back to happy news, okay? Because we're focused, our corporation, right? remember, I'm the CEO, right? Keep that in mind, I'm coming up here pretty soon. Because I'm the CEO, I'm myopically focused on financial success. Why? Because whenever I want to take a decision, I say to the accountant or the, or the finance department, give me the most recent financial statements, and they bring me a balance sheet which is correct and incomplete. And think about this. If the balance sheet is incomplete, and, and then the income statement is also incomplete, because it's supposed to take revenues and costs, but it's missing a lot of costs. There's no cost in our corporation for polluting the water and making our employees sick. We, there's no cost in there. So, the, so what happens now is our our assets and liabilities on our balance sheet are either way too high or way too low. We simply don't know. They're just wrong because they're incomplete. What we can say is that every corporation in the world is grossly over-reporting their profit. Because if we're consuming human capital, 
and we're consuming natural capital, all right, and we're consuming social capital, and we're not paying for it. Okay, sometimes we do, okay, but most of it we don't pay for, right? This is what economists call externalities. Right? So if we're consuming all of these resources for free, then our profits are, are grossly overreported. And you can see this, for example, especially in, in companies like oil companies, right? Oil companies, I mean, you know, I, a company like ExxonMobil makes, I'm going to guess, a couple hundred billion a year in profit. Well, if they, if they were forced to pay for the environmental damage they're doing producing oil, if they were forced to pay for all the future costs that we're going to have to pay for in terms of climate change, well, ExxonMobil might not be reporting a few hundred billion of profit for you. But they're reporting that profit because they get all the revenue, but we as a society don't, don't force them to pay all of their costs. Right? So it's kind of crazy. So here's what happened. When you, when you say you, 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 you want to maximize shareholder value, that means you want to maximize earnings per share, right? Total profit divided by the total number of shares of stock, earnings per share. That means I need to maximize net profit, net cash flow. How do I do that? Well, there's two ways to maximize net cash flow, right? Net cash flow. Net cash in your hands after you've paid every conceivable expense. All your revenue minus all your costs, including taxes and all that stuff, and net cash flow. How do I maximize net cash flow? Well, there's only two ways. I can increase revenue, or I can reduce costs. Now remember, I, I'm the CEO of our corporation. I'm myopically focused, as I must be, on maximizing shareholder value. And you might say, well, why? Why? Why are you? Why? Why? Why, why are you? Come on, Paul. You're a nice guy. Why are, why are you focused on that? You know better. Ah, well, because almost every corporate executive of every big corporation now has their salary tied to the stock price. This is an innovation that came about in America uh, all, the, all the world's best and worst ideas all came from America. Okay. <laughs> all the best and all the worst. Um, if you tie my compensation to the share price, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to make sure that every decision I take makes the share price go up, makes the value per share goes up. Right? You're compensating, you give me a bonus. Hey, if the share price goes up a dollar, you get an extra 20 cents. Better yet, we're going to pay you a salary, and to minimize your taxes, we're only going to give you a small salary, but then we'll give you a, a, a ownership of a bunch of shares of stock, so that when you retire, you, you have that stock to live off of. Fine. What am I going to do? I'm going to do everything humanly possible to push up the value of the share price so that my stock portfolio has a maximum value. And this is extremely common. You cannot name one major corporation in the world where executive compensation is not tied to share price. And you can, okay, right, you can see why this is leading us down a really kind of ugly uh, path, okay? What happens, at, what's happening is we're creating uh, business environment where we start doing what I call the pursuit of more for less. Right? How do I make more profit and spend less money? Because you know, there's only two ways to increase your profit. You raise your revenue or you reduce your cost. But think about it. It's really hard to raise revenue. You have to what? Like invent a new product, uh, innovate some new service. You, 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 you know, you've got to invest in the research and development, you got to do the marketing, it takes time. It's really hard to raise revenue. You've got to compete and take customers away from the competition, right? But that's hard. It takes time. It's easy to reduce cost. It's easy to reduce cost. You know how you, how you reduce cost? Well, we're seeing this. Think of every one of the countries you come from. Think of Ukraine. 
There's a reason why one and a half million people immigrated from Ukraine last year. There's a reason for that. <laughs> okay? There's a reason why. Are you ready for this? There's 320 million people in America. 320 million people. 95 million people don't have jobs. They're not looking for jobs. That's a big social question. You might ask, what the hell are they doing? Well, they're living off of, you know, various forms of welfare and voting for Donald Trump. They're angry. Okay. Um, so the first thing corporations do, all right, is they reduce employment. Best way to save money, best way to drive up costs, especially because you're being measured quarter by quarter by quarter on your share price. Um, you can reduce wages. Now, you've, it's very hard. You can, how do you reduce wages? Simple. Um, if, if you were hired, um, I, have a, I have an older brother, and he's like the last generation to ever work just one job, okay? I told you, I worked, I've had four or five, not just jobs, careers, and you all will too. He went to work for the phone company. And then through time, he got cost of, he was in the union. Through time, he got cost of living, a beautiful health plan, a beautiful life insurance, retirement benefits. But, you know, about every 10 years, the company would change and they would start hiring new workers. Every time an old worker would retire, they'd hire a new worker at a lower wage. They would hire a new worker not only at a lower wage, but they'd say, you don't get a, we're not going to pay for 100% of your health care. You've got to pay 20%. Well, that's, again, reducing their wages, reducing your cost, raising your profit. Okay? Corporations have been attacking labor unions. They used to have a very high level of, of membership in labor unions. Corporations, starting with Ronald Reagan, teaming up with him, they were very good at destroying labor unions because labor unions caused a lot of trouble. They wanted their workers to, to get paid more money. If profits go up a thousand percent, we'd like our workers to have a ten percent pay raise. Well, can't have that <laughs> because that's going to affect our share price, my executive compensation. Um, this is the big bug of expand automation. Uh, there's a company named Foxconn, a Taiwanese company based in China. They produce every Apple product in the world. And the chairman of Foxconn in initiated, no, no, not, not too many years ago, a, a program. He did it over three or four years. And um, I think I have the numbers right. He purchased and installed, I think, 200,000 robots, and he fired a million people. And he fired a million people because the workers were beginning to cause Foxconn lots of trouble. They didn't like the horrible living conditions. They didn't like the, the low wages. And, and, and Foxconn wanted to maximize its profit and maximize its shareholders' income. And I, I guarantee you that all the major executives at Foxconn have, have you know, executive compensation tied to the share price. So you, you would put in automation. Now, automation, I'm not saying automation's bad, but I am saying that if you're going to put in automation, that might be a positive thing, but every time you do something positive, it's the laws of physics, right? Equal and opposite reaction. So let's assume that putting in automation is a very positive thing. Well, there will be some negatives. And if those negatives are loss of employment by semi-skilled middle-aged men by the millions, your country has a problem. Maybe, maybe the problem gets solved because people immigrate from Ukraine to America. Or maybe the problem doesn't get solved and people get angry and they vote for Donald Trump. Okay? All right? so, so, you know, there's a, there, there, there are social issues. You can do something good, but for every winner there's a loser, for every positive there's a negative, and society has to figure out, we have to figure out how to organize ourselves so that we can solve these problems. But this is one reason why automation is moving forward 
at breakneck speed because it reduces costs, it increases productivity, it raises profits, and, and, and that maximizes the share price, the executives become wealthier. That's what we're doing. Now, there's a couple other things we're going to touch on here. Think of the something else that corporations can do, big corporations. Think Facebook, Apple, Amazon, okay, for example. Okay? Um, those guys can hire armies of lawyers and armies of lobbyists. And they go to the government, not just in the United States, they go to state governments, and city governments, they go to governments all over the world, and they, and, and, and they lobby to have regulations reduced, like environmental regulations, right? They lobby to have the compliance cost of regulations reduced, right? If you're an automobile maker in America, and, and the U.S. Congress passes a bill, which they did, that says, you know, by 2030, you have to have average gas mileage in a new car has to be 55 miles a gallon, okay? That's about 90 kilometers. Well, as soon as the, uh, Trump became president, the first thing he did is cut a deal with the automobile companies to lower that from 55 to 25 because that's going to make a hell of a lot of money for the automobile companies. And, and how did that happen? Well, they lobbied the government. They contribute money to political campaigns. Now, these are, these, these are, everyone has a right to lobby their government. Everyone has a right to give money to a political campaign. But I think you see what I'm implying here, okay? If we're talking a company like Amazon, um, do you know that in 2018, I want, this is the one takeaway, in 2018, Amazon had a shareholders meeting, and actually it was earlier this year, and they reported that for the year 2018, they had $12 billion in net profit. $12 billion in net profit for 2018. In the year 2018, they paid federal income taxes equal to zero. In fact, not only did they not pay any federal income taxes on $12 billion of profit, they actually reported a loss and got a tax refund. All right? so, so even as the government is reducing you know, food assistance or a pension for, for people <coughs> desperately in need, they're giving a refund to Amazon. Now, how does that happen? It is not illegal. It is not corruption. Tax laws are written independently of economic laws. So if you, can, you can write the tax laws in a way that allows a $12 billion profitable corporation to pay no tax. At the same time, you're taxing a, you know, a, a, a person making 30 or 40,000 a year in America, you're taxing them to death. You can, you can give a tax refund to Amazon. It just all depends on how you want to write the tax laws. Okay, I would like to pay less taxes, but I can't go to Washington, D.C. and lobby. Now, if I'm Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, I can go to Washington, D.C. and I can lobby. And this is what's happening, and it's, you know, I'm not trying to single out people and corporations. This has been going on in America now for about 50 years. Step by step by step, we have created a system where regulations and taxes who are paid by those who are not strong enough and wealthy enough and politically well connected enough sounds like Ukraine, right? It does, sounds exactly like Ukraine, right? If you're wealthy, if you're politically well connected, then suddenly you're not paying any taxes, but if you're not, you are, okay? Now, um, I'm going to give you one more example to hold in your mind. Um, I'm purposely focusing on huge corporations because, you know, huge corporations are the ones causing the huge problems, okay? I mean, a little tiny corporation that employs 50 people, they're part of the problem, but there's a difference between a corporation that employs 50 people and, and a corporation like ExxonMobil or Apple or Amazon or, or, or DTEC or, 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 or Roshan or, you know, these are big corporations, these are big corporations. And the bigger you are, then, 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 
the, the more problems you're causing. Okay? Um, the most common business model now globally, it's a global economy, the most common business model now is the multinational business model. So again, think of automobile companies, oil companies, tech companies, think of Apple, right? Here's the model that they have developed because we have told them, it's not like they're bad people, but as a society we've said it's okay to focus myopically on financial success. It's okay to ignore human capital. It's okay to ignore social capital. It's okay to ignore natural capital. And to prove it, we're not even going to measure it and put it in our financial statements. So it's not like they're bad people. They're just playing by the rules of the game. And that's why we have to change the rules of the game. We don't want to destroy capitalism. And replace it with what? <laughs> yeah, there you go. That worked out well. <laughs> you know, let's adopt the North Korean system. No, there's nothing. Capitalism is a great system. But you know, capitalism is an old system. If you buy a car, it'll run perfectly until it's, what, 50 years old, and now the car's 50 years old, you've got a million miles. Well, you know, you got to repair it through time, right? you got to repair it, you got to update it, right? And all I'm saying about our current models of, of businesses and capitalism is they have to be updated, right? So here's how this works. I'll show you very quickly. Because this is the source of a lot of the problems we're having in the world today. Right? Problems that you're going to all struggle with, me too, but you're going to live longer than me. So you're going to struggle with these problems your entire, not just your entire working life, you're going to struggle with and either benefit from or be a victim of everything I'm talking about, unless we collectively change it. So quickly, here's how the model works. Think, think Apple, think, think uh, Apple and Fox. Okay? What does Apple do? Apple, Apple sources, produces, and assembles its tablets and its phones in, in countries where, where it is the absolute lowest cost location, which they chose China. By the way, China is losing millions of jobs to Myanmar, Vietnam, lower wages, right? This is a, a race to the bottom. Okay? So you go find where you can produce the cheapest. Wages are less, environmental standards are less, taxation is less, small bribes get big benefits. This is where you go to produce. You then create a very, very sophisticated global supply chain, which we can do now. We've got big data, we've got the internet of things, we've got big data analytics, we've got AI, we have all kinds of really powerful, sophisticated tools. We create a global supply chain, and we sell our products globally. We sell globally because that's the best way to avoid taxes. Apple, Apple set up uh, a company, I think it's the Virgin Islands, where it's, yeah, I think it's the British Virgin Islands, where there's no taxation. So Apple is an American company, and they're headquartered in the British Virgin Islands, perfectly legally. It's unethical in my opinion, but it's legal. They then leased to a company in Ireland all of their intellectual property, right? All the patents, all the brand. And the company in Ireland then turns around and pays a lease payment every year back to the zero tax company in the Virgin Islands. So, it, it, so you know, in Ireland, Apple's collecting vast amounts of money. They pay a little small tax there. The tax rate in Ireland's small. But they're not taxing very much of Apple's money because Apple is sending all the money perfectly legally to the British Virgin Islands as rent on, on, all, the, on all the intellectual property. This is perfectly legal. In my opinion, it's unethical. And this is something we have to fix. Right? We've got to fix this. Okay? So, so that's how that works. As long as we stay myopically focused on financial uh, success to, to, to the exclusion of all else. Just stay focused on financial success. If you create a startup company and all you do is stay focused on financial success, you're going to make all the same mistakes as ExxonMobil or Amazon or anybody else. This is what happens. All these multinational companies create what, what is known as a race to the bottom. Right? They go to 
they go to cities in America, they go to states in America, they go to countries all over the world, and they say, give us what we want, is, you know, and this is many, many, many people. Give us what we want, or we'll, we'll, we'll move our manufacturing facilities. Right? This has been happening in America. We've lost millions and millions and billions of factory jobs because the factories pick up and go to Mexico because it's cheaper. For them. Or they say, give us what we want, or we'll move our factory, or we relocate or reallocate our supply chain, and, and we won't buy intermediate products from companies in your country will buy the intermediate products over here. Okay? This gives them enormous power over poor cities, poor states, poor companies. When Toyota came to the United States to set up an automobile assembly plant, huge investment, they did not set up that automobile assembly plant in Michigan or in Pennsylvania or in California. Why? Labor unions. <laughs> The wages were high, the labor laws were strict, the taxes were high, the environmental laws were strict. So what did they do? They put their huge factory in Tennessee. Tennessee, which is sort of, I don't know, America's answer to Guatemala, okay? They put it in Tennessee. I just made two U.S. senators angry with me. <laughs> they put it in Tennessee because the taxes are lower, the labor laws are lower, wages are lower, the environmental standards are lower, okay? So they, you know, it's kind of like, you know, why, why, why are jobs leaving China and going to Vietnam? Well, for the same reason jobs are leaving Michigan and going to Tennessee, but then they're leaving Tennessee and going to Mexico, because everybody's now in this race to the bottom. Amazon had this contest, you may have heard about, where they said, we're going to have a second corporate headquarters in America. We want every city in America, including those that sit, whose mayors sit in the back of the room. We want, we, want, we want every city in America to give us a proposal to be the host city for our corporation. It was so shameful. It was so shameful. They got, I think, 150 cities. Now, this is not a geography class, but there is a 0% probability that Amazon was going to put its corporate headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, or Little Rock, Arkansas, right? 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 I mean, come on. Come on. Right? <laughs> but why did they do this? They did this because they forced these cities to give them vast amounts of data on the cities and the people, you know, I mean, everything you could imagine. And all of that data they put into their big data algorithms, and they were able to do better targeted marketing on behalf of their advertisers in every one of those cities. And then what did Amazon do? They turned around and said, oh, what a surprise. We're going to put our corporate headquarters in two cities, actually. We're going to put it in Washington, D.C., and we're going to put it in New York City. Well, of course you are. It's not a geography class, but go, go look. <laughs> if you look at an American map, you'll see that putting a corporate headquarters in Washington, D.C., or New York City makes more sense than in North Dakota or in Oklahoma. Okay? So, so that's what they do. This is what's called rent-seeking behavior, where you use your market power to get more wealth without creating any additional wealth. So if I'm a Ukrainian oligarch, I use my market power to make sure I don't pay taxes. And when I sell something to the government, uh, even through Prozaro, I make sure that that, that, that that nice program still lets me sell pencils for 10 times the market price. You use, that's rent-seeking behavior. You run around and you threaten some country I don't want to pay any taxes, and if you say no, I'm going to relocate my supply chain to another country. So this is what's, this is what's happening. Also, you start with the river. Two things now in this world are absolutely global, and they move at the speed of light. Money and technology. Right? Money and technology. They move in a billionth of a second all over the world. So with our global world of instantaneous movement of technology and money, we can transfer, hide, and hoard our funds. You know, I mean, Apple alone is sitting on, I think, three, I don't know, a trillion dollars. 
couple trillion just sitting in the bank. American, maybe it's American corporations collectively have like several trillion dollars sitting in, you know, offshore bank accounts because they don't want to pay taxes and they bring it back to America. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to finish up the bad news. This, all right. Think about this, because this is the kind of business that we need to stop doing, right? I finally succeeded in talking a student to death. Okay? That's been my goal for decades. Thank you. I love you. Now I have two favorite students, okay? Okay? One that just says, I can't take it anymore, and just falls over. And one who says, I'll show you how to use this high-tech device, okay? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. We got two A plus students. All right. Now think about this. This is, I'm gonna. This will be the last little sort of negative part. Do Do you guys know what an arbitrage investment is? Fine. Whether you do or you don't, I'm going to tell you. All right. Arbitrage is when you simultaneously. I mean, like, if you can do it in a billionth of a nanosecond, right? A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So if you can do it in a billionth of a nanosecond, that's cool. You buy and sell the same thing at the same time, and, and hopefully you're, you're selling it for more than you're buying. So you buy and sell simultaneously, and you make a profit. This is arbitrage. Okay? Think about this. Very recently, an American company invested a large amount of money to lay a fiber optic cable from the New York Stock Exchange to the Chicago Stock Exchange. And the sole purpose of that, and now, by the way, that fiber optic cable is the fastest cable ever produced and ever installed ever in the world. There is no cable in the world that can transmit data faster than this cable that hooks the New York Stock Exchange to the Chicago Stock Exchange. And once they laid the cable, they then went to all the major stock brokers. They went to J.P. Morgan, and they went here and there, and they sold them access to the cable. Because, because why? Because those companies use supercomputers to do all their stock trades. And if you can speed up, and in the case of this cable, it was a few, just a few thousands of a second faster than any other cable. So the supercomputer of some stock brokerage can get information on the prices in the two stock markets a few hundred, a few thousands of a second faster, which for a supercomputer is an eternity, right? So a few thousands of a second faster, and so those computers can make more trades faster and make more money. And they might only make, you know, a, a one one thousandth of, of a penny per stock trade, but they're doing hundreds of millions of stock trades all the time, 24-7. Seven days a week, 24-7. That is that is the best example I've ever seen in my life of an arbitrage investment. It is totally wasteful. It doesn't create one job. It doesn't make the world a better place. It doesn't make human beings healthier or happier. It's just pure arbitrage investment so that already filthy rich stockbrokers can be even more filthy rich than they were because they can benefit from this case. This, nothing, I mean, again, perfectly legal investment, really super high tech, very smart of those investors to do that, but it's the kind of investment we don't need anymore. <laughs> it's the kind of investments we have to stop making. All right, I'm going to have mercy on you guys, and I'm going to quickly jump over here. Here's, here's the takeaway I hope you'll take away, okay? This is not a pessimistic class. No doom and gloom, all right? Remember, counting is fine, corporations are fine, capitalism is fine. Let me give you an analogy. You can use a hammer to build a church. You can also use a hammer to kill a grandmother. 
Right? Right? Well, come on. What's the problem here? The problem is the psychology of the guy using the hammer. Right? There's nothing wrong with corporations. There's nothing wrong with capitalism. Your grandmothers are safe. I I'll use a different thing. Right. You can use a hammer to build a church. You can use a hammer to build a casino. How's that? It's a better term. Leave my grandmother. The point is, there's nothing wrong with corporations and capitalism and market economies. There's nothing wrong with accounting. It just reflects our current human psychology. The psychology of Ukrainians and the psychology of Americans and the psychology of it, well, from whatever country you came from, we all have the same psychology, and we just need to change it, okay? And you're going to get these, so you, these slides, and this is what we got to do. We just have to align social purpose with corporate purpose. We're seeing that. Think wind energy. Think solar energy. Wind energy and solar energy are, are very good for the environment, right? Yeah, there's some negatives, lithium-ion batteries, right? But but that's nothing compared to you know burning coal in a power station. So you got to align corporate purpose with social purpose. You do that by by people screaming at corporations and suing them and voting for progressive politicians, changing the laws, changing the psychology. You vote with your dollars, right? Vote with your dollar. Start shopping and buying from companies that are socially responsible. Um, this is something that's being worked on by academics, policymakers around the world, which is creating a new system of financial uh, reporting so that we can then pass laws, pass regulations, and start requiring corporations uh, uh, to, 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 to put values on, on not only what they're consuming, but what they're investing. Right? So if I do something as a corporation that makes the air cleaner, that makes my my employees healthier, that's an investment, in, and I should be able to put the value of that investment on, on my balance sheet, and I should be able to put the cost of that investment on my balance sheet, just like if I bought a piece of equipment, okay? So, so this is where we're headed. We're headed to what's called a socially responsible corporation. I will probably come back to you again, I don't know when, and I will give you a long list of socially responsible corporations, some old, mostly new, that are operating according to the model I'm telling you, and they're making bucket loads of money. Okay? They're socially responsible, and they're making bucket loads of money. And they're doing it by, again, aligning a social purpose and a corporate purpose, and they are investing in improving, conserving these three most important scarce assets. The world is drowning in land and money and buildings, machinery, equipment. We have more, I mean, there's more money within a mile of this building than you can possibly imagine, okay? But, but this is what's scarce. You know, healthy, productive, creative, happy human beings. They're scarce. You know, right? Natural capital, right? Think climate change. Think of the environmental damage. Social capital. Think of all the problems that exist in every one of your neighborhoods and cities. These, these capital assets are necessary not just for business survival, but for human survival, societal survival. That's what we have to start investing in. And finally, it operates ethically, right? No rent-seeking behavior, no arbitrage investments, no, no lobbying the government so that your corporation doesn't pay any taxes, but your corporation does, right? Okay, so, so you know, this is, this is, and by the way, this is happening really, really quick. Okay. People are demanding corporations operate ethically. Some of the largest investment funds in America are held by universities, like Harvard University. They have a few billion dollars in their trust fund. They will, they, they, for a couple decades now, they will not invest in companies that you know, produce weapons or, or cigarettes, or, right? So, so you're getting 
um, they, 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 di they divested, like when we had uh, sanctions on the apartheid uh, regime in South Africa. A lot of universities, a lot of labor unions, when they saw that, a, that some American company or British company was doing business in South Africa to help prop up the apartheid government, boom, they sold the stock, they disinvested. Right? So we're, we're seeing that. And don't forget, this is probably my, my granddaughter calling again. Okay. Everybody, everybody be patient. She's two and a half, okay? She's not calling, and I can't get my phone. I'm having technical difficulties. Okay, from now on, you, you and I are going to do this together. Okay. Now, all right, I put this in bold because here's the optimistic thought. You know, you can operate ethically as a corporation. You can be ethical. I, you know, you can invest in human and social and natural capital. You can care about your communities and your environment. You can produce products and services. Look, Nike, God of all people, Nike. Okay, that's a big, ugly corporation. And what is Nike doing? They're beginning now, and so is Adidas, another big, ugly corporation. They're beginning to introduce 100% recyclable shoes and 100% biodegradable shoes. They invested a lot of money in the R&D and in the technology and in the manufacturing, and now they're investing in the marketing. Why, why do they care about shoes that are recyclable and biodegradable? Because you do. Because they know that psychology is changing, especially you know the younger you are. And they know that there's actually in America tens of millions of consumers who will say, I'll buy that biodegradable shoe over that non-biodegradable shoe. And by the way, they cost the same. I'll buy that recyclable shoe over the non-recyclable shoe. Because, because, you know, ethically, psychologically, I'm changing. That's why they're doing that. Uh, it's kind of ironic. One of the largest investors in wind and, and solar energy are the major oil companies. Not because they're nice companies but because they want to be energy producers. And they don't care, ultimately, if they sell you energy from the sun or energy from a dead dinosaur. They want to sell energy. So, so people are pushing them this way. Okay, remember those. And we're going to end with, we're going to end with that. Sometime in the 70s or 80s, Milton Friedman, the you know, American economist, came up with this meme that corporations exist to maximize shareholder equity. I think that's been a really negative and disastrous meme. Meme. And I think we're seeing the negative results of that. Um, Mark Zuckerberg came up with a meme. I don't like his meme either. And he's not so young anymore, by the way. Right? He's like 35 or something. Mark Zuckerberg came up with a meme, and his meme was, move fast and break things. I hate that. <laughs> so I came up with my own meme. I said, I can do better than Zuckerberg. I can do better than Milton Friedman's group. So I came up with this meme. This is my meme. Move with purpose. Now, your purpose can be, I, I want to be rich. Cool. Your purpose can be, you know, I want, to, I want to eliminate some disease. Your purpose can be, I want to do, I want to. You can do something from, I just want to make money, to I want to save the whales and everything in between. Get a purpose, move with purpose, and improve things. So that's my view. So if I was to ever give you another test, it would have one question. And the question would be, what is the coolest meme you've ever heard in your whole life? And everybody, yeah, and everybody will say, move with purpose and improve things. Because that's, that's it. Okay. We're going Think about that. Think about it. Move with purpose and, Im and improve things. All right. That's it for today. So thank you for being patient. Thank you, guys.